Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions. Again, we bring back Chris Davey. Chris, how are you doing? I understand you're in Miami at the moment in a, in a coffee shop, so there's a bit of noise in the background. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm in Starbucks here, actually, uh, in full order now, just up the road from Miami. Uh, Taking take a bit of a break for Chinese New Year. Cool, sounds good. All right, so let's get straight into it. We're going to be talking about product development. You've developed quite a few of your own products. We've had you on the show before discussing a failed product. Uh, I do believe it was a stand for uh, an Amazon device. Remind me again, what was it? Yeah, it was an Amazon Echo stand. Yeah, no. yeah that's yeah. right. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a bag, but let's walk through your process of developing a product. So let's start with the skill sets that involved it that you you have i mean do you design on the paper or are you drawing on cad or how do you start the process okay um yeah let's go right back to the beginning then so um what what i was struggling with when i first got into amazon i wanted to design my own products but um my, my problem was is i'm not great at drawing uh, yeah. i kind of had this product and it was like stuck in my head and i was like how can i get this product out of my head and into the supplier's hands if you know what i mean yeah? yeah so i actually um do 3d uh in using a program called sketchup yes which yeah. used to be a google program yeah. um and there's loads and loads of great um training videos on youtube that can help you um like learn how to use sketchup yeah. um because like i said the real the real problem my hand was is i had this idea for a product and it was like oh how the hell can I explain what I want to the supplier? Um, so that's why yeah. I that's why I need to teach myself how to use SketchUp, basically. Okay, so we we started with the bag, yeah. So you designed a bag. What kind of bag was it? Uh, it was just a small bag, yeah, uh, an EVA bag actually. Which um, is used for what? Uh, I was used for headphones for headphones. So. Gotcha. Okay, so small bag. What kind of material was it made from? Uh, it was uh, EVA, yeah. You know, EVA no, is, uh, you have to excuse my ignorance here. I'm not okay. up on the development side of things and knowing all the different materials. So EVA, okay. explain what that is. You, you'll have come across it. Basically, it's a foam that can be molded. Yeah. Um, and you make, a, you make a laminated sheet. Um, so we had a laminated sheet with like suede on the inside layer and uh, nylon on the outside layer. And then you basically, you buy it, you, you create a mold tool. And yep. you mold the product, you mold the, the, the bag to the tool um, to create the, the finished uh, design, basically. Gotcha. So what did you, in, in, in this case, so you, you designed, did, was this something you designed on SketchUp or did you go out to a third party and did this kind of articulate what you wanted and they, they had a product designer come up? No, with no, you? no. I totally designed it myself. Um, yeah. So basically what happened was, was I had a lot on Amazon. I saw some products on there that were selling quite well and I thought they were pretty rubbish, to tell the truth, and I thought I could do better. Um, but I'd actually um, purchased some of these for my previous company. Yeah. Um, so I didn't design them, but I was involved in the purchasing, so I, I knew a lot about the process and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So what, what was important for this product was we were trying to get all the dimensions right. I wanted this to like fit perfectly to the product that we were designing. So I was basically, you know, measuring the headphones that I wanted it to fit, and I was making it for specific, specific headphones, and I was I was measuring um, what I wanted it to fit, and then translating that into creating a drawing for the product. Yeah. But there was it was a bit more complicated than that because I had to find out from the supplier what the when they molded this material, what the thicknesses would be, you know, what's the thinnest they could do, what's the All thickest the they could do. Tolerances, yeah. Yeah, the tolerances and, uh, you know, what's the advantage of having it thick, what's the advantage of having it thin, you know, and all this stuff. Um, you know, so I needed to use the supplier a lot to give me a lot of advice because yeah. um, otherwise I would have ended up with something that wasn't what I really wanted. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I think, like, you know, you can get a huge amount of information out of the supplier uh, to help you with this. So, Okay, and, and what type, what did you, how did you manage to prototype it? Because obviously there's so many different ways you can use sheet metal fabrication, you can use 3D drawing, there's wood, people use different formats, but on something like a bag, what would you use as a way <laughs> and utilize a, 
or create a prototype if you like yeah well it's kind of a shell bag yeah so it's, it's kind of hard in yeah. some respects yeah um if i was doing it now i would have 3d printed it but yeah. back then i just went with it um i just uh created the drawing went backwards and forwards between the supplier adjusting bits and pieces until the, until i felt like it was right and then we ordered the tool and luckily enough for that product it, it came in and it was very good you know the the size and everything was great um but obviously the mold was just one part of the development yeah. we then developed like you know the zips the colors the the little tabs inside with like branding on and and the fob for the zip with branding on it yeah. um so there, there was a lot of there was a lot of other development apart from just making the mold that fitted the product. So. Yeah, I mean, on that bag then, so you've got multiple moving parts in theory, haven't you? If you've got a zip and you've got a drawstring and you've got uh, like the icon, that you know, not the icon, like the inner label with the branding on and stuff. So is there much really to do there in terms of design? Or you can say to your factory, look, guys, I want a zip on it that looks a bit like this. Or do you have to get really technical and deliver everything on a high spec technical level? Well, what I, what I found was, is like, you know, when, from reading through the supplier, the reviews on Amazon from the other people, lots of people were complaining about the zip. Yeah. So I don't know if you're aware, there's this famous company called YKK, which are probably the most famous zip manufacturer in the world. It's a Japanese company. Right. So I specified, I want YKK zips yeah. on this product. Um, and then they were like, oh, well, you know, this is going to cause, like, some delays and it's going to be extra, you know, and then, like, we dig down in it and it was like, okay, it was going to be 20 days for delivery of the zip instead of 15. So, okay, it's going to add five days. We're right at the front end, so it's like, okay, it's going to add five days. And it was, like, 20 cents more expensive or something like that. Yeah. And then they were like, oh, do you want the genuine YKK one or do you want the fake YKK one? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like we went with the genuine one. And, um, you know, we needed to color code the zip, get the, you know, we need to give, oh, that was the other thing I missed out here, actually. We went through, we had like five different colors on this. Yeah. So I don't know if you're aware of Pantone guides, but basically Pantone guides is like a Bible, if you like, for color references. Yeah. Um, just in case your audience don't know about it. And basically we went through there and we selected all the colors we wanted. We wanted five different colors for the product and we wanted one color for the zip. So it was quite in depth. You know, I created like a, a PowerPoint document, which was basically my specifications to the supplier with all the drawings in it, all the color references, all the zip references, the little tab uh, that, you know, that's on the zip. Um, that was basically molded from rubber. Um, and we did it in like three colors and we did it as our company logo yeah. and the label inside that was embroidered label. We did all the artwork for the label. And then there was basically a wrap, a cobble wrap that went around the product and then it went into a bag. So realistically, um, like just this, having a discussion, you just think it's just a single form. It's right. It's a bag. Okay. Not much going on there. But then once you start introducing all the color coordination, the zips, all the, um, like logos, designs, all the other peripheral elements that go onto the bag, it is quite in depth. So I imagine at this stage, you, you'd have to get your, now your QC. And I mean, how would you control a process where you've taken one item, but then instead of coming out the gate with one item and then go into variations later, you've literally come out the gate now straight away. What kind of complications did that put in place? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we did was, because I'm obviously living in China, we had like two development meetings uh, at the suppliers factory for the product and these were basically you know vital these having this meeting at the factory probably saved i would say anywhere between three to six months on development of this product yeah. because i had some special ideas that i wanted for the handle yeah. and the supplier was just like trying to give me the handle that they made for everyone else you know they got two or three handles that they make for everyone else and they're like oh, why don't you do it like everyone else? And I'm like, I don't want to. I want to do it like this. Yeah. And they were like, oh, they were like whinging about it. You know, they were like complaining. And um, I went there and had a meeting and I sketched out on the whiteboard, right, this is how I want the handle to look. Mm -hmm. And like, we talked about the stitching for the handle. And literally, I didn't even know they were doing this. I went to lunch 
I came back from lunch and a sample was on the desk. They made the handle while I was there and it was nearly perfect. And I was just like, oh, this is okay, but it needs to be a little bit shorter and this stitching needs to move from here to here. And literally half an hour later, they'd made me another one. So in a three or four hour meeting, I'd managed to finalize that handle for the product to get it exactly how I wanted it. Yeah. Whereas if I was in like the US or the UK, a six weeks. Uh, it would have taken weeks and weeks. Yeah. yeah. By the time you've received it and then, then it was wrong and then you need to change it. <laughs> so yes. no, it makes um, total sense. And, and same so, with the colors as well, you know, the yeah, colors, so how the colors you... was a problem with them. They were oh, like, Oh, why don't you make it black? Like everyone else makes it. Yeah. Well, cause it simplifies. I mean, what kind of, um, protocols are there in place for something like with the co uh, the colors and the matching and how do you get the right match because even if you wanted to cut corners and, and get your your supplier to show you on skype it's never going to align you know it's almost like when you're in, were in a design program and then you out output it to film and then you print it and then you get the real copy the colors don't match do they unless you know exactly what you're doing so what would be the protocol there for matching color yeah, I mean, there was some issues with matching the colors, tell the truth. So we gave them the Pantones, and what happened was is they went out to their suppliers, and they got the nearest colors to the Pantones, yeah. and they sent me the samples. But they were quite far away in the end, yeah. um, or some of them were, not all of them. We had five different colors. Um, so what we ended up doing, actually, is we ended up making a compromise. And this is something you might, you know, you might have to do when you're designing products, yeah. because... The options were, we could get exactly the right color we wanted, but it was like minimum 1,000 meters of material. Ah, I see, yeah, yeah. 1,000 meters of material was enough to make like 10,000 bags. And at this point, we haven't sold any, yeah? So it's like, I'm, <laughs> I'm not confident yeah. to go ahead and order 1,000 meters of material. So you had so, to go off, off the shelf, basically, what was available in the nearest Pantone, was that right? Exactly. So we, we like we went around all the different suppliers and we got like all the closest ones to the right Pantone. And then we like maybe had three or four that were the closest. And then from each one, we picked one and this and this materials were available off the shelf. Yeah. So. And were you able to do a bill of materials with the uh, factory so you can break down all the different components to determine, well, that bit's too expensive. Go so that route. That color's too expensive because they don't have that Pantone to hand. It's going to increase yeah. the MOQ costs by the material that's ordered in, etc. Yeah, we did do that, um, but we didn't do it right at the beginning on this product. Um, we kind of did it a little bit later when they were trying to put the cost up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when they were trying to put the cost out later, we went back and like finalized the, the bit of materials. Because right at the beginning, it was a bit fluid. Yeah. Um, and I was making like, for instance, I suddenly decided, oh, I don't like the inside of the product. I want to mm -hmm. make the inside nicer. Yeah. So we changed from the normal like a felt material to like a suede material. And then we also changed to add in a memory foam. Yeah. Uh, so it was a bit, the, the design was a bit fluid. So cool. And in terms of if we started to break down the cost of these and the time it took to put them together, I know you said this product didn't go to market, but we're using this as an example because obviously nearly every product you develop goes to market anyway, and you've got numerous out there. Yeah, I mean, we did, we did have similar products that went to market. So just this headphone case, we didn't go ahead with in the end. So what, um, what were we looking at in terms of cost? So the initial design you come up with, you've done on SketchUp, you taught yourself before it switched. The Google product SketchUp is free, wasn't it? But isn't it now a premium um, product now? I think. I think it's a paid for product now. It used to be free on Google, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I think it's a paid for product now. I've had, I've had it for three years now, so... Yeah, so um, you, you, I, don't, I don't think it's that expensive though. No, no, exactly. Um, so you, you're designing in, in SketchUp and then your next step is prototyping. One of your favorite methods now is to do 3D printing, which I think we said before is like 10 bucks or 20 bucks running stuff off is in China. It's cheap, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's really cheap. I just, I just did a 3D printing, which is like a 300 millimeter long product. Yeah. And it was like, 28 pounds so it's like about 40 dollars i guess and you know what's it's, the turnaround it, time on that to get that to you 24 to 36 hours that's great but i suppose yeah. it's, a, it's a you know china is built on manufacturing so stuff like this should be 
ubiquitous, isn't it? Easy access. Yeah, it's amazing sometimes. You know, I've sent files to my 3D printer at six o'clock in the evening. I've had them, I've had them in my hand at 10 a.m. the next morning. So yeah. no, it's <laughs> incredible. And so, what the next stage? So let's talk about molds. Um, I think because this can get quite technical in terms of setting up the right contracts, agreement with your factory. I mean, you've got a long story, but you, you had a run-in with a factory before trying to get a mold back, didn't you? And you see them in a, um, you was at a convention, and you see them utilizing your product as an option to for new customers, is that right? Yeah, yeah, actually this one's quite interesting. So basically this supplier, actually were making a similar product to this, and they, had told me they couldn't make it basically they'd get, they'd given up yeah they told me my I, I went to their factory and done an inspection and like it wasn't very good and they told me oh your quality standards higher than apple we don't want to make this product anymore yeah so they'd, they'd already made a reasonable amount and we went and sorted through all that lot um and then basically like left the factory and then like okay can i have my tool yeah because i need to move to a new factory but um the problem was is they wouldn't give me the tool back yeah. um, and we didn't really have an agreement it was actually the first product I ever developed with any supplier after I left my company and I thought oh the tooling is only like low value it was only like $200 or something like that so I thought oh it's not a big problem so they wouldn't give me the tool back and I thought oh, okay it's not worth arguing about so I started the development with another company but the problem was this was a product that we were already making and they made the tool from looking at the product. Mm -hmm. And when they made it, it wasn't quite the same. Yeah. And their one, it didn't look as nice as the one that we were making before. And we were coming out of the quarter four. So I was arguing with the supplier trying to get the tool back, the original supplier. Yeah? So I could send it to the new factory. And they were still like adamant that they didn't want to give it back. And then I went to... I can't remember if it's mega show in Hong Kong, but one of the exhibitions in or oh, HK TDC. It's the same kind of building, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm just like wandering around the uh, exhibition hall, and then I find oh, there's my old supplier, yeah. and so then I just uh, I, the boss was there, which was a lady, and um, my, also the sales girl that I dealt with. It's only a small stand; they only had like two people on it. And I'm like, oh, like I sent you an email about getting my tool back. You haven't answered me. And then they were, they had a, like, a load of customers there and they're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. So I sat down yeah. and then I found, then I was like looking around and then I see they have my product on their stand. Yeah. And I did have a non-disclosure agreement with them. Yeah. They had, they had the product on the stand and um, this was the product they told me they couldn't even make anymore. Yeah. And so then I started getting a bit annoyed and I was like, wait there, that's my product. That's my IP, yeah. We've got like a non disclosure agreement. Like all the customers that were standing there all were like looking and I started to get annoyed with them. And um and I was then I started saying, like, I want my tool back, yeah? yeah. And then I started like basically having an argument with them in the middle of the in the middle of the exhibition. And uh, the, what, what basically happened was it's like I stand there for about five or ten minutes. And I'm like, where did I meet you? And they're like, oh, you met us at the exhibition. And I'm like, how many exhibitions have you seen me at? And they're like, a lot. And I'm like, do you really want me coming to your stand every time, scaring all your customers away, yeah? yeah. Because I say, I, you know, I live in China. I, yeah, I go to lots of exhibitions. If I see you there, yeah, I'm going to be coming asking for my tool back. Yeah. And they're like, okay, you can collect it tomorrow. <laughs> and that was the end of that. That was good then. So you got Yeah, so I sent someone in to collect it the next morning. <laughs> yeah. And so, moral of the story. So, how do people avoid episodes like that? I know it's difficult in China when you're thousands of miles away, but what would someone put in place if they're, say, they're working with a um, sourcing company, which is their feet on the ground there? Um, mm -hmm. what, what would be the normal regime there to protect yourself? I think there's some things you need to be aware of, yeah? One, one you need to have a contract, yeah, to define who owns the tool. Yeah. Um, but in China, that contract needs to be in Chinese. Yes, uh, if it's in Eng yeah, if it's English, it doesn't have any standing in, in law at all. Yeah, so it needs to be in English and Chinese probably. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, you know, suppliers quite often will tell you that they will incorporate the tool cost into the unit cost, and you'll pay <laughs> you for it. You know, over a, a over a period of products, which if you're just starting out. It seems like, oh, this is attractive. You know, I just pay 10 cents on every one and then I don't need to pay for the tool up front. 
Yeah. But the problem with this is this will cause you huge problems if you want to get the tool out later because they'll be like, oh, you know, we calculated that you were going to make 20,000 over the next five years and you've only ordered like 1,000. So it's like the tool's not paid for. You need to pay for it. And then they'll probably increase the price a lot on what they quoted you originally to, to if, if they'll let you get it out of them at all, yeah? My advice is, is don't incorporate the tool cost into the unit cost. Yeah. Always pay for the tool cost separately uh -huh. and have an agreement that that tool belongs to you, yeah, and you're paying for it, and it needs to have uh, engraved onto the tool that it's the property of your company name. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, this is something I knew from my previous company, but for this tool, it was like $200. I was thinking, oh, it's not worth the hassle of arguing with them about a contract. But if you've got something that's like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, for sure, it's worth having that and getting that yeah. in place. Makes sense. Like, and in terms of, with, with that in mind, where you've gone straight out, off, out the gate with a, um, with a product with multi-variations, how did you kind of, I know, how would you manage something like that in terms of your QC and, and your inspections and stuff? How would that be set up? Okay, I actually did the inspection myself. Yeah. Um, so what we, what we did is we set out from the samples. Um, obviously, the samples they made had some problems with them. Um, so all the things we didn't like about them, we photographed. And we also photographed the things that were critical to us, um, like dimensions and stuff like that. So we, we highlighted all this in a document, which we call an inspection document. Mm -hmm. So it's basically detailing what material samples we'd approved. And basically, they sent us a sheet of the material. for The, the, the color was obviously important to us. They sent us a sheet of the material. We cut it in half. We signed and dated half of it. Mm -hmm. And we sent it back to them uh, in a black envelope. Yeah. Uh, and the reason in a black envelope is because if you keep the material samples in UV, then they will change color. Yeah. And you'll you'll end up with like, especially on white, you know, white white cloth yeah. goes to like yellow, you know. It's like so you need to keep a reference in a black in a, in, in a black box, black envelope. It needs to be in the dark, basically. Gotcha. Um, so we basically sent all the references of the materials that we'd approved back to them and we signed them. So they keep one lot of their factory. We keep one lot in our office. When we go there to do the inspection, we take our samples with us because I did have before where they, on, on the red product that we made, yeah, they suddenly switched, switched the material to a, another red. Yeah. And I like got there and I actually I hadn't taken the samples with me and I'm like, this is not the red we agreed. And they're like, yes, it is. And I'm like, where are the signed samples? That I sent you, and then yeah. the sales girl went off and got them, bought it back. You can clearly see it wasn't the right color, um, so that's quite important. But we had we had like an inspection document um, which detailed all of our requirements, and that's an organic document, you know. It grows Maybe. over each inspection because of the different errors that you you encounter, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. You know, like there's going to be probably things you didn't think about or you didn't think anyone could be so stupid to do it like that. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I've <laughs> got I really need to detail that so detailed, you know, <laughs> I've got a product that um, the document originally was two pages and after about 12 to 14 shipments, it's now up to 64. So it's very, <laughs> yeah, very, exactly. very detailed, you know, but you, you, you're learning these things as you go along, but definitely it's a growing document. So to round things up here, what would you suggest for people that's just getting started and getting their hands dirty with developing their own products? What's like the little the nuances they, they should look into and avoid, you know, if they want to try and take a next step from just private labeling, the cost of developing a product can be quite small or extreme depending on your application and what your intentions are with the product. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, when I try to develop a product, I'm trying to develop the most simple product I can think of. Yeah. That's my particular... So a single form. Like. Yeah, yeah, so if you've got something... Something, that... something with one tool or something like that. I mean, for instance, yeah, i just come back from holiday, actually, and the guy I was on holiday with had developed his own product. And it was basically for four plastic moldings. And I looked at it and I'm like, with the right tooling, you can make this in one, one piece. Yeah, because it's got four different plastic moldings that basically fit together into this product. And that's basically four risks because every, every different plastic molding had a tolerance on it. 
Yeah, so it's like, oh, when it come out of the tool, if there's a variation there, you when you try and get it together, it may be a problem. So I'm like, I looked at it and I'm like, you can make this in one piece, yeah? You don't need to make it in four pieces. Also, it's four tools, yeah? Um, um, and the reason was... The problem, four times the cost. Yeah. yeah, he'd done it like that because he 3D printed it and he wasn't really thinking in so much depth. And also, uh, this product was just like, he'd made it from plastic and I, said, I think you can make this from aluminium and it'll be much nicer and it won't be that much more expensive. Um, yeah. That's a whole different thing. Um, I think you need to you need to brainstorm on a, on a piece of paper is the best thing, yeah, I think. It's like everything you can think of about that product to try and make sure you covered everything, yeah? And it's really, really difficult, you know? I, I have a background of working for a company and developing new products, yeah, and going through all of this, yeah? And there was at least, like, five or six things I forgot on this yeah. first product, I did, yeah? That was like, oh, I never thought about that. I never thought about that. I never thought about that. So... I mean, I, I do something similar. That, that just something very uh, analog is that I would take a large uh, sheet of paper you know, like, like not uh, paper, sorry, card and a, a pencil and a rubber. It doesn't matter what it is, it can relate to a product, but then you can create like little mind maps and on that big piece of paper. It gets everything out of your head. Because I've noticed when I've sat in it with a piece of software, you get blocks because you're doing all the mechanical aspects, you're thinking of too much, where it's a lot more fluid when you dash it out onto the paper. But um, that's one that, yeah. that anyone can do without any additional costs. No. That was the same with me. I found it's better to do it on paper, yeah. If I try to do it in Excel or PowerPoint or Word or whatever, yeah, and it's just like it didn't work so well. As like I, I took the paper afterwards and put it yeah. into digital format. Yeah. Um, but before that, you know, um, and the other thing I did as well for this product was I created like a mood board. Yeah. So I looked at like all the products on Amazon and I'm like, oh, I like that. That's it. I like that tab. I like that stitching. You know, it was like very, very detailed. I like that material. And it just took all the pictures of all these different products so that when I went to the supplier first off, I was like, okay, I want the stitching like this. Yeah. And I want the zip like that. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, it, it can be, uh, there's a lot of different options actually. You can have like reserve, reverse zips, waterproof zips. You know, they all give a different look to the product at the end of the day. So, exactly. Cool. Right. Let's wrap it there. It's been great having you on. Um, how can people reach you? Uh, yeah, you can catch me at Chris at FBA for you. That's the letter U, not Y-O-U, dot com. Uh, that's my email address. Or you can find me on Facebook, CJ Davey. That's C-J-D-A-V-E-Y. Um, or on WeChat. Um, if you want to WeChat me, yeah, just add me on Facebook probably, and then I'll find and then I'll uh, add you on WeChat. I'll be out in um, in April. I'm coming to China because I'll be speaking at the Cross Border Summit. I'm sure I'll see you there as well. But you have uh, events on as well in and around the Canton Fair. Do you want to give a little bit of information on that as well? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so basically, we've got an event that we've been running for three and a half years. Every six months, uh, Phase Two, Phase Three Canton Fair. Uh, it's a networking event. It's totally free. We had some sponsors there to pay for, uh, you know, like putting the event on. Um, but it's very like enjoyable, easy going. You can come and meet people who are huge sellers. You know, we had people there last time, like 40 containers on the water to Amazon in the U S and stuff like that. Yeah. It was like huge, some huge sellers there. Um, and for me, like networking is one of the most important parts of selling on Amazon. Yeah. Cause if you don't know how to do it and you've got lots of friends that are doing Amazon, you can just write a message and say, Hey, how do I do this? And someone can point you in the right direction. Exactly. Cool. Thanks for coming in today, Chris. Um, I look forward to getting you back soon guys. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget if this is your first time, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.